on this edition of Sightings. We're probably dealing with the most important issue in the history of the human race. If it's so important, why is the government hiding its UFO secrets? UFOs are downright scary. When you get right down to it, it would have severe ramifications. Then, healing miracles from inside Russia. She saved my life. Also, the mystery circles continue to form, and there are bizarre side effects. It's known as getting zapped. Three people became unconscious within the circle. Plus, they call it the trail of death for a very good reason. The whole area is haunted by pioneers that were killed. Later, guided imagery saves lives. Then, the animals have a quake sense. I didn't know what it was that she was trying to tell me. And then when the earthquake hit, I knew what was wrong. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Most people understand and accept the government's need to keep certain projects top secret for reasons of national security. But Sightings has spoken with former government personnel who charge that not only does the government keep certain projects secret, it also creates bogus projects to divert the prying eyes of the American public. It's called disinformation. What does the United States government and the military know about UFOs? And when did they know it? For nearly 50 years, researchers and private citizens have been asking for answers to no avail. Have we made contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence? Are we being kept from the truth through a systematic plan of disinformation? Certainly there is a cover-up. That's not the important question. That's a given. The ability to maintain a cover-up is directly proportional to the uh, magnitude of the secret that's being kept. If the secret is only that there are UFOs, that there are extraterrestrials coming here visiting the planet, then I submit to you that's not, a, that's not much of a secret. It has to be something so potentially shattering to the basic sociological structure of the planet, that anybody privy to it takes one look at it and says, oh my God, we've got to keep the lid on this. How are we going to tell the public? Charges of government conspiracy are nothing new. But what is new are revelations that not all secret government projects have been for the greater public good. As recently as the early 1970s, LSD was given to unwitting human subjects. In the 1940s, people received plutonium injections without their knowledge or consent. And during the Cold War, human guinea pigs were used to determine the effect of nuclear bombs dropped within close range. These experiments and hundreds of other secret military projects prove that the government is capable of large-scale deception. Clandestine operations in the name of national security came to public attention for the first time in the 1950s with the U-2 spy plane. Just before it became operational in 1954, a plan was developed in which they said, how do you hide an airplane with a 60-foot wingspan? You don't. Leo Janis worked in the Johnson White House before becoming a correspondent for Time magazine. In Skunk Works, Janis investigates the top secret test center where the U-2 was developed. So they made up a story. And the story was that this airplane was being developed to study high altitude weather and so on and so forth, and put out an official news release, lying to the American people. But keeping the wraps on a new generation of spy plane is a far cry from maintaining a massive UFO conspiracy. Skeptics charge that if our government does have evidence of alien craft or life forms, someone, somewhere, would leak it. That a secret this big just could not be kept. Nonsense. Nonsense. You can do it. I'm convinced of that. George Knapp is another investigative reporter who believes that the U.S. government consistently hides the truth from the public. He showed sightings documents that outline government procedures for launching a disinformation campaign called cover stories. Our government does it all the time. 
There are even printed guidelines for how cover stories, disinformation, are supposed to work. In April of 1994, there was even a review of the cover story policy by something called the Joint Security Commission, something hidden in the bowels of the Pentagon, and they said it in a very delicate way, we're doing this too much. We're doing it too much for the wrong reasons. It's too expensive. It's not getting the job done. But it recommended rewriting the guidelines for cover stories. In other words, let's revise the way we lie to the American public and the rest of the world. Robert O. Dean is a retired Army Sergeant Major who served on the front lines in Korea and Vietnam and was later assigned to NATO's Supreme Headquarters Command. He claims to have had NATO's highest security clearance, which is called, strangely, a cosmic top secret clearance. It was during his tenure at NATO that Dean claims he read a 12-inch thick intelligence report on UFOs. I have to be honest with you and tell you that that information literally changed my life because I knew for the first time that this, this subject was not fantasy, it wasn't myth, it wasn't legend, it was real, it was true. But why is Dean breaking his silence now, nearly 30 years after reading that life-changing report? One of the reasons I'm violating my national security oath is that I believe that the American people are losing their constitution because of the secrecy and the cover-up. We've got people in positions of power that are making national policy that were never elected for this. They're not accountable or not responsible to either the executive or the legislative branch. And that's got to stop. Dean and others charge that secret government enterprises called black projects are far more widespread and far more damaging than most people believe. And the best minds in the country are in charge of keeping them secret. The people who engage in disinformation are a lot better at it than we are at figuring it out. This document from the CIA's Office of Scientific Intelligence reveals that the agency was proposing a UFO disinformation plan as early as 1952. The document also details an investigation of NICAP, a private UFO watchdog group. They spied on it, they infiltrated it, they became officers in it, and soon thereafter, the regular members who'd kept this thing going for a number of, of years uh, lost interest. Despite hundreds of pages of documentary evidence, the only officially recognized government investigation of UFOs is Project Blue Book. Now, I look upon Blue Book itself as a little bit of disinformation to tell the people, yes, we're doing something, when in reality, Blue Book, as we understood it, was simply a public relations front. And those of us who really dug into it know that Blue Book was a cover. It was a PR cover that they didn't really address the reality of the issues. It was a PR attempt to show the public, well, we're doing some research. Yeah, we're really paying attention to it. But most of the real solid material never went to Blue Book. And Air Force pilots knew this. And according to Dean, this information continues to this day. To give you an example of the most recent example of absurd disinformation was this incident involving the Roswell incident. First, the Air Force says it was a weather balloon. And 50 years later, they said, gee, guys, we're sorry. It really wasn't a weather balloon. It was much more than that, but it was a balloon. Project Mogul. Well, I'm, I'm tempted to use terms that you'll have to bleep out. This is garbage. Uh, that's disinformation. That's lying through your teeth to the American people. And if that isn't disinformation, I don't know what is. What Dean is referring to is this 23-page statement about the Roswell incident released by the Air Force in late 1994. In it, the Air Force attempted to link veteran researcher Stanton Friedman to ludicrous stories in the tabloid. They said, in 1978, an article appeared in a tabloid newspaper, the National Enquirer. The fact of the matter is, there wasn't an article in the Enquirer. So it's not only wrong information, it has a purpose to create a false picture of what was going on. After all, it's just tabloid nonsense. Bob Dean believes that there have also been attempts to discredit his UFO investigations. We're not merely dealing with probably the most important issue of our time. We're probably dealing with the most important issue in the history of the human race. This is something I believe in my heart, that the truth on this issue will literally set us free. 
George Knapp is not so optimistic. I don't see any way it's ever going to end. The nature of the information itself, I mean, uh, uh, we all say we have a right to know, we want to know, we're ready. I'm not sure we are ready. You know, some of the, some of the more outrageous aspects of, of uh, alien visitation, UFOs, are downright scary. Now, we can say we're ready all we want, but I think when you get right down to it, it would have severe ramifications. Sightings is in the midst of its own investigation into charges of a government UFO conspiracy. We have examined hundreds of documents, including this Air Force study that concludes that there is a possibility of alien visitors to our planet, or at least of alien-controlled UFOs. We'll bring you our full report on upcoming editions of Sightings. When Sightings continues, they've been hidden from the West, but now Russian psychics share their healing secrets. She saved my life. In the 1970s, Americans saw startling black and white film of Russian psychics apparently endowed with telekinetic powers. Were they fakes, magicians, or could they really move objects with the power of the mind? Americans had no way of knowing. Russia was a closed society. But today, our sightings crew traveled freely in a more open Russia, searching for those legendary psychics. In Moscow, our Russian contact suggested that film of psychics with telekinetic powers was part of a U.S. propaganda campaign aimed at discrediting the Soviet Union. And that while America was focused on bogus mentalists, real Russian psychics were healing people with serious illnesses. She saved my life. They say I died ten times. With the help of a healer, my child recovered before my eyes. Our sightings team has interviewed many people throughout the former Soviet Union who claim that they have been healed through the supernatural power of a psychic healer. And no healer is more renowned than 65-year-old Maria Larionova, who believes that she can transfer healing energy through her hands. I operate with cosmic instruments. My hands are covered with invisible gloves. On my right hand there are inscriptions and the stamp of three saints. The cosmic symbols that Larianova describes are not visible to the naked eye. But x-rays of her right hand reveal this strange pattern beneath the skin. Larianova believes that this pattern was placed in her hand to remind her of the mysterious healing energy that she possesses. And her claims are supported by government-run health organizations, which place tremendous faith in the power of Larianova and other psychic healers. Since I was born, I have always known that I can raise the dead, heal and solve problems that people have on Earth. When I meditate, I connect with my own spirit first and then with the spirit of the Heavenly Father, the Cosmic Father with the Cosmic Reason. I feel energy pouring down from space and touching me. At these times, I can heal. Edward Namoff is president of the International Psychotropic Association and a leading authority on parapsychology. He has traced psychic healers as far back as Ivan the Terrible, through Rasputin's supposed healing of Tsar Nicholas II's hemophiliac son and into the present. Many powerful people secretly asked for advice and used it, like Stalin. Brezhnev himself was treated by a psychic healer. There have always been a lot of psychics in Russia. The Inquisition did not kill them. They were killed in the West and therefore there were fewer there. But in Russia, many such talented psychics remained. Sightings was invited to observe a demonstration of psychic healing. Karelian photographs of Mazia's fingertips were taken before and will be taken after a healing session. These photographs are said to capture an electromagnetic aura emanating from the human body. This woman is suffering from liver disease. Before Mazia begins, doctors take baseline readings of the patient's physical condition. Using an electronic sensor popular in Russia, but little known in this country, doctors will compare these readings to those taken after the patient session with Mazia. My grandmother possessed a healing gift as well as a gift for black and white magic. My abilities came to me through the genes. This is the Karelian photograph of Mazia's fingertip taken before the healing session. 
This is the same fingertip after the session. There is a marked increase in the amount of electromagnetism represented here in red. Researchers believe that it is this increased magnetism that somehow creates an environment conducive to healing. I felt so happy. I even had tears in my eyes, but it was from happiness. I felt extremely light. I wanted to fly away. And when the doctors compared readings that they had taken before and after the session, there were dramatic changes in the patient's physiology. All organs are returning to normal. It seems that they are in balance and she has entered the corridor of hell. But the doctors also cautioned us that the effects of the healing seem to be temporary. Doctors here are continuing to work with Masia and other psychic healers in a long-term study. I have had many different treatments over the years for my condition. I have even been declared dead ten times before finding this procedure. Larianova specializes in healing spinal injuries and severe spinal deformities. She claims that she can relieve pain and correct deformities through a kind of psychic massage in which she transfers energy into her patients. During healing sessions, sightings observed, Larianova emitted a strange whistling sound that she told us was an audible manifestation of the mysterious power inside her. Another seeming manifestation of Larianova's power can be seen in these photographs. Special heat-sensitive film has captured something surrounding Larianova's hands that resembles a mist or fog. Only her hands have been photographed in this way, leading researchers to believe there is an important connection between this phenomenon and Larianova's supposed psychic powers. As strange as these healing methods may seem to us, they are part of a long tradition of healing in Russia that has outlasted changing governments and ideologies. Since Imperial Russia, we have looked for a material source of paranormal phenomena. In the West, only the psychological part has been developed, while we try to penetrate the depths of psychology and physiology. We are only now learning what 70 years of communist rule tried to keep hidden. Throughout Russia and the Commonwealth of Independent States, psychics are performing healing miracles worthy of further study using Western methods. But the study has yet to begin. For many people, psychic healing is a last resort. After all, traditional medical approaches have failed. But in most of the towns and villages throughout the former Soviet Union, psychic healers are the only healers. Their psychic powers are accepted without question, just as they have been for centuries. Next, a crop circle update. What is the British government hiding? These formations are the product of a, of a creative and inventive intelligence. Recently, sightings brought you remarkable videotape of mysterious lights that appear to be creating a crop circle in southern England. The British Ministry of Defense dismissed the lights, claiming they were simply reflections from helicopter strobe lights. But the lights keep appearing and the crop circles keep forming. If the Avery mystery lights are simply reflections and crop circles are all hoaxes, why is this military helicopter so interested in this field in southern England, a field where a new crop circle has just been formed? If they have nothing to hide, why do they appear to be threatening this civilian photographer with low altitude maneuvers? Despite what he perceived as a direct threat, the photographer continues filming the helicopter. He tracks it to an adjoining field where the chopper suddenly stops and begins to hover just above a bright, anomalous light. The light is seen here, more brilliant than sunlight, pulsing in a seemingly random pattern. One witness recorded his on-site impressions. Some flashing thing on the ground. Many seriologists, crop circle experts, are investigating the possibility that these lights are, in some way, related to crop circles. One theory being tested suggests that the lights are swirling energy balls that create an electromagnetic vortex which flattens, but does not burn, crops. 
Researchers do not believe it is a coincidence that crop circles appear almost immediately after the lights are observed. What we've seen repeatedly is malfunctioning of um, electronic equipment in the fields, um, which instantly starts to work again as soon as you go out. The effect of this unknown energy seems to wreak havoc with more than just electronic equipment. Many people claim to have felt its effects. It, it's known as getting zapped. And a, f a first echelon zap is simply a standard, um, standard headache, standard nausea. It lasts uh, a couple of hours after you leave the circle. I've had this experience personally. And then there are circles which are so energetic, everybody who goes in them at the start feels ill. And um, we've had one this year which was so powerful, three people became unconscious within the circle. Half a world away, in Canada, Pat Grant, who is blind, has also experienced strange effects inside a crop circle. And when we walked in, I got a very, very frightening feeling, like there was something out there that was watching me that I didn't know about. It was just a very eerie, eerie force. Uh, around me. I think that whatever is doing this, whoever is doing this, uh, is very concerned for us that these formations are um, the product of, of a massive and prodigious intelligence, a creative and inventive intelligence. They are not taking over the radio waves and making some verbal announcement in our own terms, which we can then talk about and consider and uh, have meetings at the UN about, because they know that's not worked. Seriologist Michael Glickman continues to find new formations around the world that support his contention that this will be another magic year, as he calls it, for crop circles. When sightings returns, I looked up and I saw blood trickling down on the wall. Ghostly entities haunt the old Oregon Trail. Then, guided imagery may save the life of this child. And is it a myth, or can pets really predict violent earth changes? It's called America's longest graveyard. Between 1840 and 1860, more than 300,000 pioneers used the Oregon Trail to reach the West, and more than 20,000 died and were buried along the way. Well, now, more than a century later, people in an area near the Oregon Trail's end believe that they are being haunted. Journal entry, 1843. My wife is sick. I carry my babe through snow and mud and water almost to my knees. One in ten of the people who started west would die on the trail. The 2,000-mile-long Oregon Trail exacted a terrible human toll. For every mile of trail, there are about 15 unmarked graves. There were many accidents, gunshot wounds, uh, children falling out of wagons and being run over by wheels. The wagons were filled to capacity with supplies. The pioneers had to walk. It was a five-month trek if you were one of the lucky ones. There would be over 300,000 people who headed west, so there would be over 30,000 graves along the trail. Today, the last stretch of the Oregon Trail has a new name, Interstate 80. And Trail's End is flanked by homes and industry, never dreamed of by the pioneers. But for many, the pioneer spirit of those first settlers still remains. I was getting ready for work one morning and I looked up and I saw blood trickling down on the wall. Recently, Sightings was contacted by a family who live very close to Trail's End. Although they have asked us not to reveal their last name or the town in which they live, the family wants to tell their story. One time we had a, um, a butter knife on top of the butter and Sarah and I were watching television and uh, all of a sudden the knife flew across the kitchen floor. Julie, Gary, and their daughter Sarah believe that they are living with ghosts, ghosts from the Oregon Trail. They come in different forms, like they come in like lights or they come as real people. We had a plant sitting over there by the table in the living room and we'd come home and 
the plant would be in the middle of the floor. Julie and Gary believe that these photographs capture physical manifestations of apparitions the entire family has felt, including the family dog. Our dog, Bandit, he um, sits there and he licks the air. He barks at, like somebody's petting him. Most of the activity takes place in what used to be Sarah's bedroom. I woke up one night, it was, at, um, it was about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I saw someone, it was just like a light in the figure of a person, and I didn't think anything of it until I, my bed made a noise, and they started walking towards my room, and then I turned over so I wouldn't have to see them, and then I got a bloody nose, which usually happens when they're near me. She'd uh, get to the point that she wouldn't go into her room. Sarah would have to sleep on the floor in our bedroom because she was afraid to go, to go into her room. When the spirits turned violent, Julie called in a local psychic and family friend. Where are you today? Linda felt the presence of a pioneer spirit, too. She did some research and discovered that the home was built on land once owned by pioneers who had lost many family members to the Oregon Trail. There's no doubt in my mind that the whole area is haunted by pioneers that were killed along the trail. Although only one family has come forward, many locals told our sightings crew, off the record, about the ghost of a little boy who wanders through town. One day my friend and I were walking down by the playground and there's a little boy and he was holding onto the pole like he was very scared. And when we looked back 10 seconds later, he was gone. Well, there's no way he could have gone out of the playground because the whole entire playground is fenced. And if he would have gone out, we would have heard him and seen him. It's a beautiful playground, but if you drive by, you'll see there's absolutely no children in it. Like and haven't been, because there's a spirit little boy that comes out and wants to play with the children. And it frightens the children. Sightings asked parapsychologist Dr. William Roll, an expert in psychokinesis, to conduct an investigation. He was joined by paranormal researcher Alex Thomas. And there seems to be a line of activity coming through from that far wall through this corner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, was this your room, Sarah? Yeah. The team believes that the haunting here is caused by a phenomenon known as place memory. There has been so many things pass through this area, so many people, so many tragedies. The Oregon Trail, the trail of death. In this particular case, the stuff that's being generated from deep within inside the earth is much like the playback portion of the tape recorder, and the mind is acting like the speaker. Dr. Roll believes a geologic fault located directly under the home may be influencing the ghostly activity. Sometimes the natural energies combine to create very striking effects. Uh, one of the effects that are produced is like sort of mini tornadoes, sometimes lights. Animals will very often respond to them. But electromagnetic anomalies generated by the fault don't explain the poltergeist activity Julie reported seeing. Some of the occurrences in, in the home, such as uh, the plant moving across uh, the floor, appear to be due to, to PK, to psychokinesis, a mind over matter effect. Dr. Roll believes that the haunting is caused by unusual natural forces, combined with supernatural residue imprinted on the land. His findings have encouraged the family in their decision to move away, somewhere with less history, far from the Oregon Trail. No one can say with certainty whether or not Central Oregon is experiencing spiritual residue from the past. But this story does remind us that the American dream is often built on the suffering of those who tried but failed to make it. Next, guided imagery is saving lives. He made it go away with his visualization. Our consciousness form a blueprint for what our body does. In the past year alone, over $100 billion has gone towards finding a cure for cancer. There have been some promising advances, but progress is slow, and people who are dying can't afford to wait. Many search for a cure outside of the medical mainstream, and sometimes they find it. 
I'd get up in the middle of the night, just um, two, three o'clock in the morning, wake up and put a mirror underneath him just to make sure he was still breathing. It was every parent's worst nightmare. When he was only three years old, Rocky Edwards was diagnosed with leukemia. Early detection, radiation, and chemotherapy put the disease into early remission. But at age nine, the cancer came back. Dr. Maureen Halasik is a radiation oncologist who reviewed Rocky's case. In 1985, Rocky Edwards was found to have a large tumor of the brain called a meningioma. He underwent two surgeries, the latter of which only removed part of the brain tumor. This was followed by external beam radiation, which was completed in April of 1986. The following summer, there was a third attempt to remove Rocky's brain tumor. It was unsuccessful. His parents were told that their son had less than a year to live. They took him home to die. I can remember standing in the hallway outside his room, and the doctor said to us, there's nothing more we can do. We've done everything surgically possible. He said, uh, take him home, enjoy him. If you haven't passed Christmas, consider yourself lucky. I wasn't at all willing to talk about death. I just didn't even want to look at that possibility, even though it was definitely there. Rocky's physical deterioration was rapid. He was paralyzed on one side of his body, and mentally, he quickly descended into a deep depression. I didn't like myself at that particular time when I came back, because due to the medicines they had me on, it made me blow up like a balloon, just about. and. That had a lot to do with it when I came back. But Rocky came from a family of fighters. His mother searched for an alternative therapy and found a light at the end of the tunnel. Deirdre Brigham is the author of Imagery for Getting Well and the director of a behavioral medicine clinic that treats people suffering from critical illnesses. What we do is deal with the emotional and psychological and the spiritual issues that frequently come when you're faced with a, a critical illness. Let's take time now to go on a journey. The cornerstone of the Getting Well program is a process called guided imagery. Here, Rocky is creating a series of images in his mind that help him fight his disease. Amazing things happen. People begin to relax. The blood vessels are not tightening up. The heart begins to slow down. The immune system begins to work well. And that's sort of basically what we're, what we're geared upon, that our imagery, our beliefs, our consciousness form a blueprint for the way our life is going to be lived and for frequently for what our body does. Rocky didn't need an awful lot of help. He had in mind what he wanted to do. At the time, the first thing that popped in my head was the uh, Ghostbusters, which happened to be one of my favorites then. And what I did is I kind of pictured the uh, Ghostbusters and then nice little Andy packs, but with God's light coming out of them, like in a laser beam. And I kind of pictured the uh, tumor itself like a big giant ball or something, cloud, and the Ghostbusters aiming their lights, hitting the, this ball, um, disintegrating it and making it disappear. Imagery and an improved mental well-being may help from the standpoint of immunity, which is needed to fight disease. The Getting Well program was founded on the principle that mental well-being, laughter and love are the keys to physical recovery. I don't like the idea of terminal. I think that we're making a lot of assumptions when we say someone has a terminal illness because there's not a single illness that there is not at least one person who has recovered from it. And I say, if there's one chance in a hundred, one chance in a thousand, why not go for it? Why shouldn't you be the one? When a physician gives a patient uh, a time diagnosis, as to the remaining lifespan, oftentimes the patient will program their mind and their body to expire at that time. On the other hand, alternative therapies given in conjunction with surgery and radiation uh, may help the patient from the standpoint of their mental well-being. After eight months, Rocky's mental outlook improved dramatically, and guided imagery seemed to be affecting his physical body as well. The doctor who read 
the MRI said that there was calcification showing around the tumor and that the radiation Rocky was on was starting to work. Right. But Rocky was not on radiation at that time, so we just felt it was the light that was Rocky was directing at the tumor. In 1991, Rocky had another MRI. His parents wanted to check the size of his tumor, but the tumor was gone. I believe it was a number of things to um, help cure the tumor. I believe the gaining well had a lot to do with it. I believe I had a lot to do with it for fighting to live. And I believe my um, family and my parents had a lot to do with it. Without the program, Rocky would have died. Most definitely. Without, without going through the getting well, I, I feel he would not be here today. Modern science can't tell us how it did. So as far as I'm concerned, yes, he made it go away with his visualization. I wouldn't say I'm a special case. I'm just say I am one of the lucky ones that fought my way through this cancer because I wasn't going to let it beat me. The people that come in here are exceptional. And it doesn't mean exceptionally intelligent or exceptionally rich or whatever, but there is something within them that is willing to risk things for their own dreams. That takes a very courageous person and a very special person. But if a person is willing to do that, it can happen to anyone. It's important to note that guided imagery is not intended to replace a patient's current course of cancer treatment. No one should undertake any alternative therapy without discussing it first with their own doctor. When sightings returns, the experts call it quake sense, and it may save your life. I know this sounds crazy, but I know my cat predicted the earthquake. It's been a year since the 6.8 Northridge earthquake hit Southern California. The freeways are being rebuilt and homes and businesses are being restored, but nerves are still frayed. When will the big one strike? Seismologists say it's impossible to predict the exact date of any earthquake, but some people believe that animals possess a sixth sense that warns them when the earth is about to move. It's called quake sense. Fish will jump in the air sometimes before earthquakes. So just a whole schools of fish leaping in the air. The pigeons really went, if I can use the phrase, bonkers. I know this sounds crazy, but I know my cat predicted the earthquake. Mainstream scientists dismiss these accounts as anecdotal. They insist that there is no way for any animal, including humans, to predict an earthquake. But Sighting spoke with one respected scientist who disagrees. I was sort of unwilling for many years to accept that animals really knew something that our scientific gadgets couldn't detect. Jim Berkland is a geologist who spent 20 years analyzing earthquakes for Santa Clara County, California. During that time, he noticed that an unusually high number of pets ran away from home just before a big quake. I was reading the lost and found column, and I almost shuddered to see 27 missing cats when I was used to seeing three or four. What do the cats know that I didn't? They're reacting to the electromagnetic field and the magnetic fields that change prior to quakes. This is documented. We know that these changes occur. And I'm convinced that animals can detect these changes. Before Berkland began linking animals and earthquakes, he was well known for his seismic windows theory that the changing gravitational pull between the moon, sun, and earth has a reciprocal effect on earthquakes. Combining that theory with information about missing pets in Northern California, Berkland accurately predicted the 7.1 quake that hit San Francisco in 1989. This newspaper account of Berkland's prediction appeared four days before the actual quake occurred. I have never seen anybody predict earthquakes as accurate as he does. Nick Corini raises championship homing pigeons. He depends on Jim Berkland's predictions before racing his birds competitively. Just before we have earthquakes, they become very, very uh, energetic, very active. They're, they're very uncomfortable, and it affects them tremendously in a very negative way. The negative effect on his pigeons that Corini describes has been documented scientifically. When the pigeons are trying to come home, uh, they know where north is, they use the magnetic field to come home, and if the magnetic field gets distorted, the pigeon races can be endangered and they, uh, they don't like to fly, and that's usually just before an earthquake as the pigeons fly over a, a quake area that's about to kick off. 
we know that animals have senses that are much more developed than ours. Dr. Bernadine Cruz believes that animals do have special sensitivities that humans do not possess. Animals have some abilities that we will never have. A dolphin's ability to echolocate, a bat's ability to send out these sonar waves and to pick it up and to be able to get around basically blind. I don't know if I can honestly say that an animal can tell when an earthquake is about to happen. I think they can sense that there are changes that are going on in their environment. The problem with animal prediction of earthquakes is it's so difficult to interpret what the animals are doing. But seismologist Dr. Kate Hutton does concede that there are subtle warnings before a quake that animals may be picking up. We know there are electrostatic changes. Um, in a few hours or minutes before an earthquake um, because of the strain being released in the crust. Uh, and they might be sensing that. Following the 1994 Northridge earthquake, many people reported that their pets had sensed the quake before it happened, including Sighting's own rider. She jumped on the bed and she jumped right on my chest and she started meowing very insistently. She runs down the hall, she leads me into the baby's room, into the closet, and she's cowering in the closet. It happened over and over. And I kept saying, what's wrong? What's wrong? Unfortunately, I didn't know what it was that she was trying to tell me. So I went back to bed and I said to my husband, that's it, we're taking her to the vet in the morning. I mean, there's something wrong with the cat. And then when the earthquake hit, I knew what was wrong. Cats handle stress in a lot of different ways. Cats oftentimes when they get stressed will become very reclusive. They'll just go ahead and hide. But can pets really succeed with quake sense where the most delicate scientific instruments have failed? Being the writer for sightings, I have to be skeptical because we hear all kinds of stories from all kinds of people. Some of them are hoaxes, some of them are genuine. So when I started telling people at sightings that my cat had predicted the earthquake, they were dealing with me in the same skeptical way, and I was mad. I was saying, wait a minute, my cat predicted the earthquake. And they were kind of, yeah, yeah, sure. So I had a little bit of a taste of being on the other side. Jim Berkland is used to being on the other side. His earthquake prediction methods are looked at with skepticism by his colleagues. I had to make that choice some years ago. Was I going to conform or was I going to inform? and I have to come down on the side of informing because I have a greater duty to the society. Many people in earthquake country report that their pets act strangely right before a big jolt, but their accounts aren't specific. Until pet owners begin writing down and documenting their animal's behavior, the concept of quake sense will remain unproved and unaccepted by science. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the Sightings Hotline at 1-900-933-SIGHT. That's 1-900-933-7444. Each call 65 cents a minute. Average call lasts three minutes. Sightings is also online. Our email address is sightings at aol.com. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, The Sentinel. This week at Sci-Fi.com. In a dark future, Chi Chong must save Manhattan from the evil insect menace. Chi Chong, the animated series. Only online, only at Sci-Fi.com.